Welcome to Murray Desert Seventh-day Adventist Church online this Sabbath. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here speaking with you. Uh, I'm Pastor Harley South, the uh, Associate Pastor of Murray Desert Seventh-day Adventist Church, uh, and this is actually my second time, uh, only second time really, uh, which is, uh, but anyway, my second time sharing with you, but my first time sharing online. So I would like to welcome you, uh, and for those of you who are logging on now and joining up, we're very glad to have you on and to see you uh, to on, 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 on with us today. We're, uh, just, we don't really have any announcements today, uh, so we'll go uh, straight into the offering. Uh, as you, you know, are probably catching up with, with things now as far as the e-giving app goes, there are a number of op different options are coming up on the slide now uh, with the e-giving. And uh, so you can, you can see there just on the website or on the app, uh, with direct giving in other ways as well. And if you have any questions regarding this, contact uh, treasurer, treasurer, the treasurer, Roger, or Hayden, uh, who is the tech guy. And also options are available for mailing in checks to uh, the treasurer. Uh, contact him for more details on how you can do that if that is your style. So I'll just give you a few moments if you are doing that now, uh, and then we'll have a prayer over the offering. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, uh, we know that times are tough at the moment, and so we pray that you will multiply this offering in your service, uh, that it may achieve that to which you send it for, Lord. Uh, may you bless it and the initiatives in which it is placed. Lord, it is our privilege and honor to worship you in returning our tithes and offerings to you today. We ask this and we ask this prayer in the name of Jesus. Amen. Uh, before I begin my sermon, I actually have a short children's story. Uh, so for some of the kids who are tuning in, uh, you can uh, gather around real quick now, and this is your special time. I'm going to share a story today about um, my mother. Uh, when she was growing up, she grew up in a farm in a land far, far away called Wisconsin. That's in the country of America. And so she grew up on a farm, and she had a horse named Dusty. And every and guess why this horse was named Dusty? Because it loved to roll in the dust, and it was a very dusty horse. Anyway, it was her job. Every morning, one of her chores was to go out to the feed shed where they had all the feed for Dusty to get a big old scoop of oats and to take it down and put it in the feed trough there for Dusty to, to munch on during the day and for her breakfast. Uh, and so one day, my mom, she goes walking out of the house in the morning, you know, before she goes to school and she's, you know, going to do a chore. She goes down to the feed shed, she opens the door and, ah! guess what? There's a mouse sitting on top of the pile of oats. But this was, an, uh, was not a normal mouse. This was a fat mouse. A fat mouse. And this mouse was so fat that he was just there. I'm not really fat, so I can't really... Sure, but imagine my arms are like a mouse. It's like, this is what he was doing. He was just rolling side to side. He locked eye contact with my mom and was just rolling. He was so fat, he couldn't even run away. And after a while, my mom was like, what is this mouse? Is What's going on with him? And so she went back. She got her dad, who's my grandpa, and they came and they looked at the mouse, and he was there. He's still there. He, what had happened? I reckoned he got into the feed and just started eating and 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 eating until he was so fat and he was just rolling side to side. And my grandpa put out his foot and touched him and he fell over and he died because he had eaten himself to death. That's a bit of a funny story, I think. But anyway, if you find, find that kind of stuff funny. But I'm just, I can't believe it. This mouse had eaten so much food that he actually couldn't move anymore and he died. But sad, but funny. So kind of, it's a mix. Anyway, there's a lesson to this story. Sometimes in life, we find good things. And the Bible says, you know, if you have fine honey, eat it because it's good. But then in another place, the Bible says, if you eat too much honey, you'll vomit it out of your mouth. There's a lesson to be taught about temperance. That's not a big word, but it means self-control, meaning that when you eat good things, you eat what you need. You don't eat too much, you don't eat too little, but you don't eat too much either. 
And that was what this mouse needed to learn. He needed to learn a lesson in temperance because he just got in there and he ate and he ate and ate and ate and ate and ate and ate, 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 ate. And guess where he ended up? That's the story of the fat mouse. <laughs> Thank you for listening. <laughs> um, we're going to have a quick prayer now before I begin my sermon. If you will bow your heads. Dear Heavenly Father, this is a message that's very close to my heart. Uh, it's a message that I believe your church needs to hear, and it is a message that you have given to me to preach. But I pray that it is not me who is seen, even though I'm on this live stream, but it will be your word which will be magnified and lifted up. Your word which will be shown, and the truth as it is in Jesus and his cross. May that be what our eyes are fixed upon. We ask this in prayer. In the name of Jesus. So my sermon today is titled, The Truth for This Time. The time for this truth, the truth for this time. What is the truth for this time that we have been given as a church? That we have been given as a church. There is a German word, uh, and it's the word Zeitgeist. Interesting word, uh, which means the spirit of the age. The spirit of the age. This word is... Um, it, it, it encapsulates the worldview pervading society at this time uh, and at different times throughout history. You can think of different times through history and what was the spirit of the age, the zeitgeist of that time. And when we can think of the, the zeitgeist for our time, what is the spirit of our age? As it is summarized in, 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 in the Bible, there is, there is the zeitgeist of worldliness, worldliness. Uh, and who would it be that rules the spirit of our age? Who would it be that, that is this? It would be the prince of darkness, the prince of the power of the air. There's a quote by the author C.S. Lewis, uh, which says, enemy-occupied territory, that is what this world is. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed, you might say landed in disguise, and is asking us and is calling us to take part in a great campaign of sabotage. I really like this quote because it, it really evokes a lot of uh, interesting uh, ideas in the mind. Um, first of all, enemy occupied territory. You know, this world is occupied by the enemy. Even though Christ has won the victory on the cross, the world is still occupied by the enemy. There is a zeitgeist, a spirit of the age of worldliness of, that is against God, which is permeating the whole world. Christianity is the story of how the rightful king has landed in disguise and is calling us to join him in sabotaging this enemy-occupied territory. But I would say that I would slightly correct the end of, of C.S. Lewis's quote here, uh, that instead of calling it a great campaign of sabotage, I would say he's calling us to take part in a great campaign of counter-revolution. Counter-revolution. This, this counter-revolution, though, is seen in the Bible in Revelation chapter 14. Revelation chapter 14 verses 6 to 12, in the, what was commonly called the three angels' messages. Revelation 14, 6 to 12. So why don't you turn with me there, because we're going to be spending a bit of time in the three angels' message today. Revelation 14, Revelation 14, verses 6 to 12. Starting in verse 6. And I saw another angel fly in the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel, to preach unto them that dwell on the earth, and to every nation, and kindred, and tongue, and people. So, we're introduced here to what is called the three angels' messages. We've seen the first angel, and we're going to, as we, as we look through the sermon, we're going to see the rest. But, as this, message, as this angel comes, he is, it says, John says, I see another angel flying through the midst of heaven. There's a message going to the world, and he has the message, and it's called the everlasting gospel. He has what is called the everlasting gospel. In fact, this is the first angel. And the first angel, whose, his message I summarize with the idea of being a message of love. The first angel's message is primarily a message of love because he is proclaiming the everlasting gospel. What is the everlasting gospel? That is a question that... Um, I often had as a, as a young person growing up in the Seventh-day Adventist church until one day I came across this 
Amazing quote. Absolutely amazing quote. Ellen White wrote in 1898, Hanging upon the cross, Christ was in the gospel. When I first read this quote, and I'm going to read the rest of it in a second, but this idea here, this idea here, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. This one sentence, if you can lock that into your mind, it will transform the way you understand the Bible as you read it throughout. Because this idea, the word gospel comes along all the time. And we think, well, what is the gospel? Is the gospel good advice? Is the gospel a good, uh, a good feeling? No. Instead, the gospel is good news. Good news. And news tells us that something, event, an event has happened which has changed things that you need to hear about. Good news. Good news. It's not good advice. It's not a good feeling. It's good news. And Ellen White says that hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. I'm like, wow, this is a really fascinating, astounding concept. But then she takes it the next step further. She takes it the next step further. Now we have a message. Wait a second. Ellen White, what are you doing? Wait, 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 wait. Ellen White, one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, has a prophetic mission. And she is, for decades, she's been working, growing this church. And it's 1898 now. The church has been in existence for a number of decades. And she says, in 1898, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. Now we have a message. I was like, wait a second. Now we have a message. Well, what was the message that we were preaching before if we don't have this message of the everlasting gospel? Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. This is our message, our argument, our doctrine. Our warning to the impenitent, the... Uh, if I could just have that on the slide, please. Yes, thank you. This is our message, our argument, our doctrine. Our warning to the impenitent, our encouragement for the soaring, the hope for every believer. What a fascinating statement she makes. She says that, yes... As a church, we have discovered these amazing, powerful truths from the Word of God. We've discovered the sanctuary message. We've discovered the Sabbath. We've dis discovered the state of the dead. And we've discovered the health message, to name just a few. All these messages that we have collected, boom, boom, boom. But then she says, no, our message is hanging upon the cross. Christ was the gospel. And this now helps us understand what is happening in Revelation 14, verse 6, where another angel is flying through the midst of heaven, having the everlasting gospel having the everlasting gospel. This is a message that is to be, be encompassed by Christ's death and resurrection and the salvation by grace through faith that is offered through Christ on the cross. In the world today, this is a message that is so relevant, so relevant. The gospel message of Christ on the cross has never been irrelevant. And then the angel says, and, and then the message, then John describes how this message is going to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Our mission. This is our mission. People today, you know, we're living in a multicultural society. Uh, I know many of us are, 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 are a bit bamboozled by this, all the changes that are happening with, with so many different people. As, in fact, I was even thinking as I was driving to, the, to, the, to record this sermon, I was driving past so many different people from different cultures and races and nations. And sometimes when I'm driving, I just get a burden on my heart that people who know, who know the gospel. But this is a message that's to go to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. And never has there been a time in this world's history where this is more able to happen than now, in our time, right now. Because we live in this multicultural society. But not only that, but this is a message that is going to unite all people as children of God in friendship, support, community, and fellowship. Why do we take it to the whole world? Why do we take this message to the whole world? Turn with me to John, 1 John, 1 John. Chapter 2, keeping your hand in, in Revelation 14. But turn with me to, to 1 John chapter 2, and we're looking at verse 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 2. It says here, And he is the propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. Jesus died for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, this message needs to go to the whole world. This is not a message that is just for Christians. This is a message for everybody because Jesus didn't die just for Christians. He died for everybody. And this is our message, and there has never been a time where we can preach it more effectively than now. Not even back in Ellen White's day when she penned those words that this is our message. But now we can actually take this to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. The angel opens his mouth, and he says in Revelation 14, verse 7, Fear God, 
saying with a loud voice, Fear God and give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment is come, and worship Him that made heaven and earth, the sea, and the fountains of water. Fear God and give glory to Him. I would like to say that this message here is our great controversy message. Look over in Proverbs 9, verse 10. Proverbs 9, verse 10. That was Proverbs 9, 10. As you turn there together. It says, The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the holy is understanding. What does it mean to fear God? To fear God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. What, is, what Solomon is here saying is that to fear God is to know God. To fear God is to know Him. And what does it mean to glorify? To glorify is, to, is, is defined to describe or represent as admirable. To describe or represent as admirable. And so when we describe and represent Christ and God, our, it, in order to glorify Him, we need to be doing that in an admirable way, of lifting up who God is in His character. What is God's glory? What is God's glory? Moses said in Exodus 33, he said, Lord, show me your glory. And in Exodus 33, the Lord passes by Moses. And yes, there is beauty and dazzling light and fire and all this stuff that over, overwhelms Moses. But that's not what his glory is because as he passed by, he declares the name of the Lord and he says, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abounding in goodness and mercy and truth. And he describes his character of the type of God that he is. People today are searching for love and belonging. They are deifying and giving glory to weak human beings, sports stars, movie stars. And this is a message, though, that is to show that God is love and true love and belonging can be found in that never-ending intimate falling in love with the Creator. Because this message gives due glory and honor back to God because people understand the character of God. Now let me ask you, how do people understand the character of God? How do people glorify God? John 17, verse 1. John 17, 1. We're bouncing through the Bible today. John 17, 1. But I never wanted to give you something that's not straight from the Scriptures. John 17, 1. And these words spoke Jesus and lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour is come. Glorify your Son, that your Son also may glorify you. Christ was glorified by the Father through the cross. The hour come, he says. The hour has come to glorify your Son that I may glorify you. Christ was glorified through the cross, and Christ glorified the Father through the cross. And so we glorify God by declaring the plan of redemption, as seen in our great controversy message, the gospel, Christ on the cross, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. See, the great controversy message is not separate from Christ on the cross. In fact, it's all about Christ on the cross. Never before has this message been more relevant. And then the angel goes on and says, for the hour of his judgment is come. The hour of his judgment is come. This is our message of the investigative judgment. Our message of the investigative judgment. Slide. Yep. Awesome. Um, turn with me to Daniel 8.14. Daniel 8.14. Some of you may have it memorized. Daniel 8.14 says, And he said unto me, Under 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. And when we study the 2,300 day prophecy, we see it ends in the year 1844, signaling the beginning of the time of the judgment and the time of the end. People are worried about the state of the world, where it's going. The message that we have, the hour of his judgment has come, is to show that according to the accurate prophecies in the word of God, God is judging, and that the second coming will be very soon. But not only that, but the investigative judgment helps us understand the character of God as well. As through our prophecies, it is revealed. In the sanctuary in heaven, Jesus Christ is ministering for us. It shows, it's, it's how he makes available salvation for us and vindicates his worthiness before the universe by what he did on the cross. This message helps people have faith in the word of God as being accurate and have hope for the future because they know that they belong to Christ and that he is in control. You see, 
even our message of the investigative judgment is all about Christ on the cross. Because without that, there would be no, there would be no blood atonement to, 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 to be cleansed up out of the sanctuary. And in the sanctuary in heaven, Christ is making effective the sacrifice he did on the cross. And so when we preach our message of the investigative judgment, it is not some dry discourse of dates and numbers. While, that's in, well, while, while the dates and numbers are a part of it because they give power to it, because of the evidence it gives that it's real, the heart effect of knowing Jesus is so powerful. And that's what it actually is all about about. Now we have a message. Behold the Lamb of God which takes away the sin of the world, as Ellen White said. Next thing that the angel says after uh, the hour of his judgment has come is worship the Creator. Worship the Creator. Worship Him who made heaven and earth, the seas and the fountains of water. And I would like to propose that there are three elements to this idea. The first is that this is the message of creation. The world is dominated by the hopelessness and meaninglessness endorsed by the evolutionary theory. Our message is to show that God is creator. But how do we show that God is creator? And what does that actually do to someone's life? To say, oh, hey, God's, yeah, God's the creator of the, of the world. So what? Check this out. Isaiah 43, verse 1. Isaiah 43, verse 1. In a world where people are stumbling around feeling empty, Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. You see, the message of creation is the message of redemption. Because the same creator God who created the world also recreates us. I have called you by name. You are mine. 2 Corinthians 5, 17 says, If anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Behold, the old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. The message of creation is the message of Christ on the cross. We can't separate them. We can't separate them. And we do so at our own peril. The message of creation in a time that is in a world that's dominated by the hopelessness of evolution has never been more relevant than right now because it's, it's all about Jesus. This message is also the message of the Sabbath. Because when God created the world, he created the institution of the Sabbath on the seventh day of creation. The world's fast-paced. It's, you know, it's, 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 it's running us dead. It's full of materialism and stress. The Sabbath helps us to, to recalibrate, to step back, to help people realize that there is, there is a God who wants to spend time with them. And at this point, I would like to ask you, what is the Sabbath truth? As Adventists, we like to say, we have the Sabbath truth. And uh, I, I shared with this person the Sabbath truth. What is the Sabbath truth? Now, if you said the Sabbath truth is that Saturday is the Sabbath, I would like to, for you to re re reconsider that response. It would be like if you asked me, Harley, what's the truth about relationships? What, what, what are relationships all about? And I said, ah, the truth about relationships is that Jasmine is my girlfriend. And you'd be like, okay, I'm glad you've got the right girl. But what does that mean? What does it mean for me? The Sabbath truth is not that Saturday is the Sabbath. That's true, but it's not the Sabbath truth. The Sabbath truth is found in Hebrews 4, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 4 shows us what the Sabbath is all about, really, in the context of what Christ has done for us. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 9 says, There remains therefore a rest for the people of God, for he that is entered into his rest, he also has ceased from his own works, as God did from his on the seventh day. The Sabbath is all about what Christ did on the cross for us to achieve, his, to achieve our salvation, and that we now rest, ceasing from our own works, works to earn salvation, we cease from those works and rest in the work that Christ has done. It's a day where it helps us to remember that there is nothing that we do to earn our salvation, but it's all about what Christ did on the cross. The rest is in Christ. He died, so we do not need to work for our salvation. The Sabbath is a monument to the gospel because Christ died on Friday, rested the Sabbath, and he rose on the first day. Just as Christ, when he finished creation, 
rested on the seventh day. When Christ finished our redemption, he rested on the seventh day. Never before has this message of the Sabbath in a world so dominated by fast-paced materialism and stress been more relevant, especially as we recalibrate people back to this idea of salvation by grace, through faith alone, not of works, lest anyone should boast. This is a message also of environmental stewardship. Our world is falling apart at the moment. The world's faced by environmental collapse. People are worried about the implications of this. Pollution, climate change, or what's, go, what's going on? They're wondering. You know, bushfires raging and, and, and snowstorms coming when they shouldn't be coming and all this stuff. Our message is to uplift the creation of God. To stand for its proper use and protection. A world that is, 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 this is the topic that's on their minds. We should be emphasizing it. Because God is creator. We are the stewards of what he's given. And we should be living lives that reflect this and give glory to God in his creation. On the cross, Jesus didn't just die for people. He died for the world. The physical world, not just the spiritual world. Because Christ is going to create a new heavens and a new earth. But guess what? It's going to be still this earth. He died for this rock to actually be, win the real estate as well as the hearts. And so if we, we neglect the real estate and we pillage the real estate at our peril, he, if we neglect to be good stewards of the environment and for advocating for the protection of God's creation, we sin against this very cross of Christ. And we make our message irrelevant to the world. Worship the Creator is how the first angel finishes his message. And we go to the second angel. He arrives right on the heels of the first. And the second angel says, a message of truth. After the first angel has sounded, the truth of the everlasting gospel with all of its most relevant sub-tenets has been understood by the world. The light of the everlasting gospel pierces the darkness of the zeitgeist, the man-made religion and philosophy. It pierces through materialism, post-truthism, nihilism, populism, socialism, capitalism, spiritualism, Catholicism, evangelicalism, globalism, atheism, ecumenicalism, salvation by works, and union of church and state. All these ideas, it pierces right through them. These are the prevailing zeitgeist, yet they are confused and contradictory. No one can understand each other anymore. It's Babylon. It's Babylon. The Tower of Babel all over again. And because this message has been proclaimed, we look over in Revelation 14. Verse 8, there followed another angel saying, Babylon is fallen, he declares. Babylon is fallen. People in the world today are confused by the multitude of voices crying out to say, this is the worldview that you should walk in. The everlasting gospel is the only truth that grounds and, and helps people understand what is actually going on in the world. It helps us to consistently understand God, ethics, the world, humanity, and truth itself. When the everlasting gospel is shared and understood, Babylon, the zeitgeist, collapses. It can't stand up against it. It's not the Sabbath or the judgment, but the cross of Christ preached, which makes Babylon fall. The cross of Christ revealed in those truths. Let us proclaim our relevant message and watch Babylon fall. The third angel arrives. The third angel arrives and he has a message of freedom. And you might be thinking, wait a second, wait a second. A message of freedom? Have you read the third angel? Let's have a look what he says. The third angel followed them saying, with, I'm in verse 9 of Revelation 14. The third angel followed them saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, <coughs> which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation. And he will be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. And the smoke of their torment ascends up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image and whoever receives the mark of his name. And you're like, well, that's the scariest thing I've ever read in the Bible. And it's true. It is one of the scariest places, uh, if not the scariest warning in the Bible. How can I be saying that this is a message of truth? Oh, sorry, a message of freedom. A message of freedom. Well, let's consider what this message is all about. It's a message warning against the mark of the beast. The mark of the beast. Oh, sorry, hang on. Yep, all right. It's a message warning against the mark of the beast. And what is the mark of the beast? Well, 
at the end time, Antichrist is going to enforce a certain way of worship through the union of church and state upon the world that will be contrary to God and to his love. This is the reaction of Babylon falling, by the way. Because Babylon is falling, it, cannot, it realizes it cannot stand against the truth, so it lashes out with force and tries to enforce his way of, re, of understanding, his way of living. Our message is a message of promoting liberty of conscience. Freedom to worship God or not, your choice. But the Antichrist message is the opposite of this. It's a message forcing people to worship their own the way that they declare. John 3.16 declares that God gave his son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have eternal life. Uh, and, and a message that forces people to believe in God or worship God a certain way goes contrary to who God is and his character of love. Forced love is called rape, and we have very strong laws against that. God does not force people to be saved or to stay saved, and when the church and state unite to force people to worship one way or the other, this is the message that's being present, preached against here by the third angel's message. So I think, so are you stand, understanding how this is a message of freedom? Because it's saying this is the way that Antichrist is going to go, but what God has planned is much better and much different. God actually respects you as a human being and your ability to choose. Now, he gives you every opportunity. He draws you with his cords of love. He uplifts Christ on the cross so you may see him and, and be drawn to him. But he never forces you. He never forces you. And in fact, this is a message which is all about where people choose to go. It's a message of warning saying you need to choose the right thing because if you choose the wrong thing, there's only coming the scariest warning in the Bible. Drink. He, whoever worships the beast in his image receives his mark in his forehead or in his hand. The same will drink of the wine of the wrath of God poured out undiluted into the cup of his indignation. The strongest warning in Scripture. The zeitgeist, the spirit of the age, is anathema to God. It, 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 it's, it's corruption, it's sin, it's disgusting. Our loving God cannot stand against it, and stand it, and He will destroy it as He, as a father beats an abuser who assaults his daughter. This righteous indignation comes up, wells up within Him. Now I'm not saying that you know that uh, on this earth fathers are, are just in doing that, but we all understand what kind of motivates a father to do that in this in this world. It's the same thing which which motivates God to have undiluted wrath against the mark of the beast and the beast and those who who follow along with it. So. As our Father who loves us sends us this terrifying warning, begging us to avoid the zeitgeist. But we ask, where is Christ in all of this? Where is the cross in all of this? What does this mean? How is it revealed? Matthew 26, verse 39. Matthew 26, verse 39. How can there be a message of love in a warning of undiluted wrath? Matthew 26, verse 39. Turn with me there. Behold the love of God. Jesus here is in the Garden of Gethsemane. It's Thursday night, before the day before he's crucified. It says, And he went a little further and fell on his face and prayed, saying, O oh my Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. What Christ did on the cross was he drank that cup of undiluted wrath so that we don't have to. Well, we don't realize so often because we're so blinded by our own egos and blinded by our own sinful nature is that we are deserving, exceedingly deserving, of this cup of wrath. The violations we have done against God and against His creatures, against his, the people that He's created, His children, the, the way that we have acted, the way we've lied, deceit, de deceived, abused, betrayed, objectified and used, talked behind people's backs and slandered. The corruption that is so deep within us is worthy of this undiluted wrath. If it wasn't for the Holy Spirit, we would all follow along gladly and receive the mark of the beast. And we would all gladly persecute anyone who's, who does otherwise, who, who said to do otherwise. What Christ did was he drank that cup of undiluted wrath for us. Which is why we can say that hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. 
We are deserving of this wrath. We are all depraved sinners. Jesus Christ drank the cup in the place of humanity. Whoever claims his life as their own has eternal life. Has eternal life. Why is this a message of freedom, you might ask? Well, C.S. Lewis has another quote, which I think is very profound. He says, speaking about the end, he says, there are only two kinds of people in the end. Those who say to God, your will be done. And those to whom God says in the end, your will be done. All that end up in hell, choose it. Without that self-choice, there will be no hell. No soul that seriously and constantly desires joy will ever miss it. Those who seek find, to those who knock, it is open. The choice is ours in the end. We either say, God, your will be done and receive heaven. Or we say, or God says to us, your will be done and we receive hell. Here is the patience of the saints. It goes on. Here is the patience of the saints. The zeitgeist is hostile to the everlasting gospel. To live in the, with God will require endurance and patience in this world. It can only be done through relying on Christ constantly and daily, having a daily relationship with him. Because it says, here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Here are the Bible... Here, the Bible prophesies that those who will stand against Babylon at the end, those who have this message, are going to be those who keep the commandments of God. They understand that because they love Jesus so much, they obey his commandments. And because of this, they're living by the faith of Jesus. They're not living by their own faith. Let me tell you what, your faith will never ha you will never have enough faith to be able to go through the trials to come. Even the trials that we're going through now, day-to-day -day trials. We don't have enough faith to do it. Only those who live by faith. Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. In Galatians 2.20, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Wow. And then he says, give this, and the life which I now live, because Christ is crucified with, within him, the life which I now live in the flesh, in the body, my daily life, the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Not by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me, but by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Because when you surrender and are crucified daily with Christ, Christ on the cross was the gospel, you have the faith of Jesus empowering your life. This gives these people the, with this message the power to be able to keep the commandments of God because they have the faith of Jesus. If you try and do this on your own faith, it's like a rope of sand. It will get you absolutely no one. And then this is a little tacked on at the end. Some, some people miss this. Revelation uh, 12, uh, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Right, blessed are the dead which die in the Lord from henceforth. Yes, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors and their works do follow them. Blessed are the dead. Tagged on the end, we have one final footnote. The zeitgeist today is fascinated with the afterlife. Spiritualism. All these, you know, it's, it's in all the media. It's in all, the, everywhere you look. Spiritualism here, there, everywhere. This is a message. This end time message is a message that cuts through the lies of spiritualism and shows the true state of the dead. It's a rest of sleep until the resurrection. The hope in the resurrection. And what is the hope of the resurrection? How can we have a hope in the resurrection? Because Christ died on the cross and rose the third day. Because he died, and he rose. And because he rose, he is the first fruits of those who will rise, and we can have confident assurance that there will be a resurrection for those who die in Christ. We come now to the conclusion, and I'd like to share a really interesting story, vision, in a sense. Of, it's a vision in the form of a story that Ellen White had. I call it, uh, and you can read it in... Um, in Spiritual Gifts, Chapter 3, you can just Google that, and you'll, or Google Ellen White's Vision Lamb Temple, and it will come up. So in this vision, she's, she's in a, a town. She's in, a, she's in her hometown, and she's, it's, it's a dark and gloomy day. And she sees a temple 
in, the, in town. And she sees many people flocking to it for safety from some impending doom that's coming. So there's a sense that she has over her that something's coming, something dreadful is coming, and a bunch of other people have this dread as well, and they're going into this large temple in the midst of, of town. There's lots of people standing outside the temple, though, mocking those who are going in. Now, Ella White, she is desirous to go in, she's desiring to go inside this temple. She, 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 she feels her need to go inside the temple, but she's, she's afraid. She's timid. Uh, she's, she's afraid of those, those who are mocking, and so she says, well, maybe if I wait a little while, They'll, they'll, the mockers will disperse, dis disperse and I can sneak in before the, before the doom comes. But as the <coughs> time progresses, more people come and start mocking and, and she can sense this doom coming even closer. So she just musters up the courage and quickly scurries through the crowd of people and into the doors of the temple. And she writes, On entering the building, I saw that the vast temple was supported by one immense pillar. And to this pillar was tied a lamb all mangled and bleeding. We who were present seemed to know the lamb had been torn and bruised on our account. So she enters this temple, and the temple is supported by one great immense pillar. And tied to this pillar is a lamb mangled and bleeding. And everyone realizes, wait, this lamb is mangled and bleeding on our account. All who entered, she writes further, all who entered the temple must come before it, and confess their sins. Just before the Lamb were elevated seats, upon which sat a company looking very happy. The light of heaven seemed to shine upon their faces, and they praised God and sang songs of glad thanksgiving that seemed like the music of the angels. These were they who had come before the Lamb, confessed their sins, received pardon, and were now waiting in glad expectation of some joyful event. Upon entering the temple, you see the Lamb, upon the pillar which is supporting the whole temple. It's bruised on your account. You confess your sins upon that lamb, and the guilt is lifted. These people realized that they had escaped the doom that, had, that was coming because of the lamb, because their sins were forgiven. What does this vision mean? What, do, what, what, could, it, what, what could it represent? I think the, the meaning is fairly obvious. A lamb, we know, who is the lamb? Behold the lamb of God who takes away the sin in the world, declared John the Baptist when he saw Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ was the Lamb of God who died for our sins on the cross. Hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. But this Lamb is on a pillar that supports the whole temple. There's a number of other, you know, there may have been another number of other pillars around the temple, but none of them could stand if it wasn't for this one central pillar upon which was Christ, upon which was this Lamb mangled and bleeding. As a church, we have a message that people run to to find safety from the doom to come. The three angels' message that we have shared, to, that I've shared today, we have studied and understood it in a, new, in, a, in a profound way, is a message of finding safety from the doom in coming on the world. Fear God, give glory to Him, for the hour of His judgment has come. Worship the Creator. We've seen it. It's all about the great controversy. It's all about the investigative judgment. It's about creation. It's about the Sabbath. It's about environmental stewardship. It's about... The truth, it's about liberty of conscience, it's about you know, the state of the dead, faith in Christ, but it's all encapsulated with this one central theme, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. When we make the Sabbath the pillar upon which we rest our church, it crumbles. When we make the state of the dead the pillar upon which we rest our church, it crumbles because those are just the support pillars. A support pillar cannot hold a temple. The one central pillar does. The temple is our message, the everlasting gospel, the foundation of which, the essential structure of which is the cross of Christ. The whole structure of the temple, every other pillar is supported by and cannot exist without that pillar. Build your life and ministry on that pillar. In my life growing up as a young person, it took me 18 years to discover this message. Oh man, I loved our, I loved our message. I would go online and debate with people all the time. But I didn't love the real message. I loved the truth of the Sabbath. I loved the truth of creation. I loved the truth of the state of the dead. And I would debate people till we were just all ready to go home and no one had changed their mind because that's how debate works. But anyway, one day I discovered, hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. This is our message, our argument, our doctrine, 
are wanting to the impenitent the hope for every believer. And my life was recalibrated. I understood that Jesus is what it was all about. And I understood what it meant that Jesus died and loves me. He died for me because he loves me. And then I started reading the Bible again. And I'll tell you what, it made so much more sense. Not only that, but the Sabbath made so much more sense. It wasn't just, I discovered the Sabbath truth wasn't that the Sabbath was Saturday, but that the Sabbath is the day of rest, where we rest from our endeavors to earn our righteousness, to earn a living, physically and spiritually. And all came in with that message, Christ on the cross. Make this the foundation of your message. Never preach to someone about the Sabbath without preaching to them about what it means that Christ died on the cross. Never tell someone about the, the state of the dead without proclaiming the resurrection and the life, which is Jesus. Build your life on this message. When you read and study the Bible, don't read it for ammunition to unload upon people, but read it for to, to know Jesus. Because then when you share, people will actually be attracted rather than repulsed. My appeal is, let us focus our eyes on the cross and focus others on the cross. This is the Seventh-day Adventist message. This is why God's called us as a people. And this is the message that we are to take to every nation, kindred, tongue, and people. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I want to thank you for your great love for us and for giving us a message for such a time as this. Hanging upon the cross, Christ was the gospel. Lord, Forgive us for the times where we have put the cart before the horse. Forgive us for our misunderstanding of your love and our taking advantage of it. Help us to recalibrate and refocus. And teach this message of love, truth, and freedom. Christ on the cross. Empower us with the Holy Spirit, Lord. Because now we are preaching the message that you really actually want us to preach. Thank you for hearing and answering this prayer. We ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.